guys. So nice to see so many seats filled. Welcome to Click Clock. This is the first debate ever to occur at Horology Forum. Today's debate topic is called Do a Double Take. And today we will discuss whether the watch industry's family business will thrive or be stifled uh, without fresh blood. My name is Barbara Palumbo. I am the resident instigator slash troublemaker at Dubai Watch Week and have been now uh, for four times. Uh, the format of this debate will work as such. Kind of half high school debate team, kind of half presidential. Um, I will ask a question to one of the speakers who will have four minutes to answer the question. The opposing speaker will get three minutes to either cross-examine uh, or offer a rebuttal or a series of both. Original speaker will then get two minutes to reply and should the opposing speaker feel the need, I feel like Tim will, they will get the final 60 seconds <laughs> to solidify their opposing argument. Uh, we do ask that the audience stay quiet as much as possible during the debate as the speakers... <laughs> <laughs> The speakers have not been given their questions ahead of time, so they don't know what's going to be asked of them. Uh, they will need time to thoroughly think through their answers, but I feel like these two are going to be completely great with that. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce both of these speakers to you. Fiona Kruger, on my right. She's the creative force behind her namesake brand, wearing it today. Go ahead and show it off, Fiona. A designer with a fine art background, Ms. Kruger holds an honors degree in fine arts and master in product design and craftsmanship for the luxury industry. Uh, beyond her own collaborations, she is an e professor and has been involved in multiple design collaborations, including with brands such as Fabergé, Tisaki, Ulysses Nardin, Le Pay. Ms. Kruger has both taught a master class and appeared on a panel with me, actually, uh, at previous editions of both Dubai Watch Week and Horology Forum. Tim Masso is a content creator extraordinaire. Uh, as a resident watch expert at Watchbox, he was instrumental in establishing the company's video-first marketing strategy, which has grown to generate over 4.5 million unique views on YouTube every month. Weekly, Mr. Masso and the Watchbox team produces more than 25 unique hands-on watch reviews, effectively bringing a brand catalog to life. Also no stranger to Dubai Watch Week, uh, Tim has conducted in-depth interviews with watch personalities, collectors, and watchmakers during past events. So please give a round of applause to your two debaters. <laughs> The first question, see, my job's easy now, I just ask away. First question's going to go to Fiona, so you're going to get four minutes. Uh, keep an eye on the clock, and I will, I asked for a bullhorn to, you know, but they didn't give me one, so. Uh, as one of the very few women in the watch world who started their own brand, what do you see as the biggest positives to not having had a prior history or the reputation of a family member or members coming before you? Hmm. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, I think there's been multiple benefits. Um, I didn't, it wasn't something that I ever really considered until other people kept bringing it up when they would speak to me about what I was doing. Um, you know, I'm an artist first, so my head is always about what I'm making. It's all about the piece that I'm working on, um, uh, the concept, uh, is it meaningful enough? Is it interesting enough? And visually, how do I translate this sort of big idea um, into something that people can recognize and have a kind of emotional connection with? So that whole side of things I never really thought about until the question kept getting asked. And initially, when I kept getting asked about this, I thought it made me sort of look around and go, oh, you know, maybe this is going to be a sort of negative thing because I don't have, you know, the pedigree of uh, the majority of the other people that I was encountering in the watch industry. I mean, I'm not even Swiss. When I started uh, the company, I was 25. And I remember going into my very first supplier meetings with this big sketchbook, this sweet 25-year-old blonde at the time, a uh, Scottish girl, and, um, and not really being taken seriously. Having said that, I think being an outsider um, is the best thing because I had no ideas of what I should be doing. So I never designed or created anything from a place of should. Um, 
I was inspired by the rich horological history um, of the whole of the watch industry and particularly the Patek Philippe Museum's historical collection. I mean, those pieces are extraordinary um, and they still hold a cultural weight and significance today. And the other thing about them is, you know, they have pieces shaped like angels, musical instruments, uh, animals. And so for somebody that didn't know anything about watches, didn't know anything about mechanics, I could still relate to watches. I mean, it was in that museum that I fell in love with watchmaking because the symbolism and the imagery was still relevant like 200 years later. It didn't matter actually who made it to me. Um, the piece itself still resonated and in 200 years, it will be the same. And that was kind of the approach that I took. So I think there was a real... Um, once I stopped, you know, worrying about why everybody was asking me that sort of question, um, there's a real freedom that comes from the fact that you don't have this kind of weight of a family history that you feel like you have to consider. Um, it means that everything that I design and created comes from a real place of freedom. I will also say that when I'm doing collaborations for other brands, they have their own rich heritage, um, their own sort of language. Um, and in those instances, I think being an outsider is really helpful because I pull references from everything but the watch industry. I mean, to be honest, I don't look at other watches really very much. Um, it's a bit like if you hear a really good tune, it gets stuck in your head and then you can't think of anything else. And if you see an exceptional watch design, I mean, it just sticks. So I look at everything but that. And it means when I'm collaborating with the other brands, it's my job basically to disappear and kind of frame what's really special about them, and that's it. Thank you for your answer. I'm going to ask the person standing directly in front of the clock. Thank you. So I'm going to need to see that. <laughs> Appreciate that. Tim, you have three minutes. You have until uh, 3.10 for your rebuttal or your cross-examination of Fiona's answers, please. Well, I think the best way to approach this is just to take a look at how I entered the watch industry, but more importantly, how I stayed in the watch industry. I started at a company called Watch You Want, which had no family history in the industry, and I have no personal family history in the watch industry. But in 2016 and 2017, I learned the value of a long-term family commitment to the watch industry when first Danny Govberg and his Philadelphia-based jeweler came in and bought what you want, giving us a level of reach and resources and financial security we never had. And then after that, when Mr. Liam Wee came in, and he had previously been associated with his family business, Sincere Watch, out in East Asia, he brought institutional memory and commitment and passion and resources that by ourselves, Govberg and Watch You Want would not have had. And it's really those two family traditions of Mr. Liam Wee and Danny Govberg that made the watch box base possible. We built on that. We built on two family traditions. And you can have a meritocracy within family traditions. I'm neither a Tay nor a Govberg, and I'm relied upon for my expertise within the company. So you can have oversight from people who are deeply steeped in the tradition of the watch industry and still have people who are, if you want to call them bootstrappers, pulling their way into the industry from the outside, breaking down whatever glass doors or ceilings may exist. I don't think the idea of family commitment and family patrimony we could use a word frequently used in this industry. I don't think those undermine the competitiveness, the longevity, or the innovation of a business. And I think I'm kind of sort of living the proof of that. Uh, broadly, if you look at watch retail, well, retail generally, it's a huge turnover business. If you're looking at cars, real estate, annuities, you see new faces every year, every month, sometimes even every week. And a family with a long-term commitment brings a level of stability to the retail space that you would not ordinarily get if it were just outsiders coming and going through a generic retail job. The watch industry is intimate, it is personal, it is extremely focused on localities, whether they be regions, in the case of the Siddiqui family, or specific cities, as in the case of the Govberg family. And I believe that institutional memory is all for the best. Doesn't mean I can't be a part of the picture, just that I sort of rode in on the coattails, and that's often true in this business. Very good. Fiona, you have two minutes. Um, I think there's I think there's maybe a difference in terms of um, the the role of an outsider in different parts of the of the business. So for example, 
Um, the bit where I'm focused on is the creative side. And so the driver for me is creativity first. Everything is a creativity first approach. And it's, I'm also very, very aware that basically uh, nobody needs a watch. Uh, we don't need more watches, frankly. I mean, there's enough <laughs> already. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Tim. Uh, we, just don't, we just don't. That's why it's a debate for <laughs> So, um, So if I'm going to create something and make another thing that then exists out in the world, it needs to have a longevity and a value that goes beyond me. It's actually not about me, which, um, which sounds daft because, you know, the brand's my own name. That was, uh, a ki that was just a very simple, I couldn't think of a name that I wouldn't <laughs> hate in like five or 10 years. I thought I'm unlikely to hate my own name. Everything comes from my own brain. It's my own name. Um, anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is from a creativity and a design standpoint, being an outsider is extremely valuable. Um, particularly if you're making watches in Switzerland, because there is a very strong culture of how things are done. And um, when you come from outside, it's easier to, to work in a way that's collaborative and bring a new approach. Um, that's what I found. Having said that, I do actually agree with you, I think, on the retail side, because when we started out, I was very aware that I just didn't fit the mold at all. Neither do the watches that we make but we make them with the best people that we can in Switzerland and they're at a certain price point. And so you need people to feel comfortable investing in you when you look totally different to what they're used to. There's a kind of period of adjustment. I'm going to buzzer you. Tim gets a minute. Oh, okay. And, no. So, no! <laughs> no. So working, but I'll, I'll, I'll be, give but you I'll, an extra I'll be minute quick. I'll be quick it. though. So working with a, a retail partner, particularly a family business with a heritage, brings a kind of trust, which from the consumer side, I think, is really, really important. And that was why at the beginning we chose to work with selected retail partners that really had that. It wasn't just about understanding what we did, but they had that kind of heritage because it does bring a kind of trust element. So Tim, I agree with you there, but I'm not, give two minutes. But not two on the creative now. side, I would you say. You get one extra minute after that. See, this is why we need chronographs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you take a look at retail and then you take a look at manufacturing. And I think it's important to consider both sides, the selling and the making. Look at three well-known brands, Vacheron Constantin, Audemars Piguet, and Patek Philippe, the Holy Trinity. We all know them, we love them, but by far the strongest of the three are Patek and Audemars. Because at the highest level in the manufacturing side, as with the retail side, it helps to have the institutional memory and commitment of a family that realizes it is a custodian for the long term and not seeking short-term profits. Vacheron is under the umbrella of the Richemont Group. There's a lot of overlap. There are shareholders to be satisfied. There are production targets to be met. At Patek and Audemars, you have stronger brands because of the involvement of the founding families. Jasmine Audemars is a newspaper editor. Olivier Audemars is an engineer. Neither one of them is a watchmaker. For that matter, the Stern family is not a family of engineers and watchmakers. But the fact that they have that long-term intergenerational commitment has produced a stronger business in the end than going to find the outsider who could solve the problem in the short term. It's always the long-term vision and commitment of the family that makes the difference. All right, Tim, uh, on that, and I think this is actually a great segue, your question is, if you heard someone in the industry say family values are imperative for success in the watch industry, what, would, what feeling would that give you? How would you respond to that, whether in your own mind or, or to well, the person saying it? I would say it's kind of a generic term. It sounds like something a politician would say, family values. That's our brand. Look, sometimes family values can be a little bit crazy. Um, there's no doubt that, oh, I'm not even kidding. Philippe Dufour, how many apprentices and assistants and you know, underlings has he fired, but he had to finally commit to his daughter, Daniela, because you can't break that bond. So he finally found the patience to teach someone to the point where that person could make a Philippe Dufour simplicity. So I do think the values here are a little bit extreme and uncompromising, but I also think that it's an example of how you can and should pass them on. Family values implies value, and something of value should never be squandered. So whether it's the Audemars and the Piguets or Philippe Dufour and his daughter, that's what I see as the importance of family values. 
Value, yes, but then continuity. All right, Tim, you have three more minutes. You can. Okay, I'll keep going. Go. Yeah. So let's take it. Again. <laughs> let's don't, take. Don't let us down now, bro. Oh no, I don't want to shortchange you. Let, let's talk about an example of what happens when you rely solely on hired guns. Two-story brands, Gerard Perigo and Ulysse Nardin, both at one point controlled by family interests, and both of them sold to the Caring Group. Combined, they grossed over four hundred million dollars pre-Caring. Now, in the last year before they were sold by Caring, that's the last year, they grossed combined about fifty million U.S. dollars. Yeah, exactly. This man knows the deal. So you have the so-called meritocracy of people with degrees in business management and economics and marketing, and they were given free reign at brands that were healthy and esteemed before their arrival. And it's like the doctor who sews up the scalpel inside the patient. Just didn't work out, and it's proof again. <laughs> sometimes it pays to have a family that cares. All right, Fiona, you have three minutes to respond to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna just sound like I'm repeating myself. I understand the the family side of things from from a business point of view. Um, I mean, another amazing example of that is a brand that's not a watch brand, but Hermes. You know, there is a really strong kind of family heritage behind that brand. And um, I mean, they could be opening more boutiques, making more product, and there would be a market for it. It wouldn't be sort of, you know, making too much stuff that's basically going nowhere. But they don't. That's not their driver. Um, and I think part of that decision making is because it's run um, with the sort of family values that you'd discussed as a kind of guiding force. Um, so I think, from a business standpoint, um, that does make sense. Having said that, again, from from the creativity side, I mean, we might end up playing um, Gerald Genta Bingo for the number of times that his name is probably going to get mentioned over the next few days. But um, apart from him, like Eric Giroux as well as a designer, total outsider, they've both been responsible for some of the most important. Designs. If we just talk about what is it that we're actually creating, the things that are being made are coming from the minds of these people. I mean, Eric Giroux started off as an architect, so not. I mean, Swiss. Yeah, okay. You know, if you grew up in Switzerland, I mean, if you land in Switzerland, watches are everywhere. So it's kind of part of that, but not from that sector. And I think having that outside view um, when it comes to what you're creating. Um, but I've just seen time and time again the how invaluable that is because you often get told in Switzerland no. I'm sure that's not a surprise to anybody here. No, it's too difficult. It's not possible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you come from the outside, you tend to come in from a place of curiosity and not judgment. So when somebody says no, you you want to know why. And then you want to understand the process and why is it that you don't do that like that? And then the more that you discover, the more that you can see, oh, well, maybe we could do things this way. Or instead of going through steps one, two, three, four, and five, if we inverse step three and five, what would you get? And somebody that's been seeing the same thing sometimes just doesn't have the opportunity to think like that. It's the same as like why you know you go on holiday for a change of perspective, why big companies bring in outside people to avoid things like groupthink. So I th from, a, from a creativity point of view, I think that's really important. Um, but I do think that what's really interesting is the, the collaborative approach between an element which is sort of steady and has a kind of heritage to it and then bringing an outside flavor. And I think there's a tension there that actually results in some really interesting things happening. Um, this time. Bingo. <laughs> I'm getting better at you scared I won't have me. to slap you around later. <laughs> All right, Tim, this is, this is going to be for you as well. So what do you feel is the greatest issue facing watch brands and retailers who expect that their companies are, are going to remain successful uh, if they pass the torch generation without really considering outside help? Well, I think it's important to remember that when you're considering outsiders, family oversight is critical, 
But that's a guiding hand. That's not necessarily micromanagement. You can have a Francois Henri Benamia at AP, and he can run the company as CEO while the Jasmine Audemars and the Olivier sit in the background and make sure that the fundamental values are respected. It's important to remember that not every single person at a retailer or a factory needs to be a member of the family. This is not like the Saudi Air Force, where everyone's tangentially related to the royal family. This is going to be um, no fundamental in hindrance to the company, because there are other ways of getting a fresh perspective. Henri Stern was, of course, Swiss and from the family of Stern's who owned Patek, but they sent him to study and to establish the subsidiary in the United States so he could get a perspective that was not Swiss and that was not traditional. So they kept it in the family, but they found a different way to gain an outsider's perspective. Another good example, um, Edouard Melon of Moser, family company, MELB, his father established the business case for the group and the basic framework in which they operate, but he went to school in the United States and he learned American business management methods for better and for worse, got a look at our side of the economy. And the world economy in the United States is distinctive in that it celebrates failure, something he specifically said was rare in Switzerland, something that engenders real fear over there. So he brought that perspective back to the enterprise, which was family, but no longer blind to new methods. Okay, Fiona. You um, a, and you can cross-examine as well, meaning like you can ask yeah, yeah. Tim questions about what um, it was he just said. No, I mean I, I mean, I basically pretty much agree with what Tim's saying. This is a debate. I know. It's, we it's did, I mean, you're not supposed to agree. We did, we did discuss this backstage <laughs> that... Um, <laughs> I'm a bit of a care bear, so I'm not exactly the person to like bring on stage to have a battle with somebody. Uh, yeah. Um, would you, do you mind, because I was too busy actually listening to what Tim was saying, do you mind repeating the initial sure. question? Uh, yeah. Is there a brand or brands today, whether you name them or not? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Great, greatest issue facing both watch brands and retailers who expect their companies will remain successful if they pass the torch only to the next generation without considering outside help. Yeah, yeah, I've got. I mean, I think, but I think that's kind of a, a sort. I don't think that would be watch industry specific, to be honest. I think if you're running a business, um, if you have a heritage that you can pull from, that's like a very rich sort of library of. Um, inspiration that, that you have that other people don't have. Having said that, I don't think that you can just rely on your past. I don't think that creating things and working in a way um, where you're basically leaning on nostalgia as your kind of uh, driving force, I don't think that that's enough, actually. I do think that you need to be able to be forward-looking. Um, and so I think... I think there's very few businesses, particularly family-run businesses, that do have that, um, how do you say, what's the kind way of saying it? I don't want to say laziness, I'm just going to say it. That, that, that have that sort of laziness of going, oh, I'm just going to pass this on to my son or daughter and that'll be fine. I think most family businesses, because if they've built it from the ground up, know that you have to be flexible, know you have to look outside your bubble. Um, and they, so that's why I'm agreeing with Tim in the sense that those are examples that show that people knew that they were coming with something, but they'd have to look a bit outside. Um, and again, I think that's just another example of that tension that I was talking about between knowing what you have, but also not being afraid to sort of look forward and look outside of what you are comfortable with. You know, I think being comfortable with being uncomfortable is a really powerful tool. And I do think actually that family-run businesses are more adept to doing that than, you know, when it's a big, big business with, you know, shareholders and it beca it's a bit like ch trying to change direction of a big um, cruise ship. You know, it takes time. Even big businesses, if they're family run, I think tend to be more open to sort of navigating choppy waters because they have the experience uh, and the lived experience of how things sort of go like this. So they do tend to be more open-minded. Tim, can you debate with yeah. Fiona on that, please? <laughs> well, I think it's important to remember that there's always this sense when you talk about 
hereditary businesses that there's going to be entitlement or stagnation or you're going to get some insane like King Joffrey from Game of Thrones type character or Emperor Commodus from Gladiator and the whole city's going to burn down. Uh, usually not the case. The best case scenario is that a family is able to pass the business on to the heirs who are most engaged and most able. There are many Govbergs, not all of them are interested in watches. And it's also true that there are many Siddiquis, and not all of them are interested in watches. So within the family, there is the process of selecting the people who are both most able and most inclined to run the business. And I think that has its own kind of redeeming quality to it. It's not necessarily the worst of the worst getting control of the empire. And I think that's sort of the misconception that often comes to mind when people think of inheritance. Fiona, you have a minute to just um, offend him in some way, shape, yeah. or form. <laughs> Make make fun of us. Sh- I don't know something. Just no. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna pass. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this question is gonna go to you. Um, okay. Is there a brand or brands today, whether you name them or not, mm. you're a Care Bear, but but please do feel free and you don't have to be shy about this. Uh, you feel would have benefited because of their lineage, had they decided to not go outside the family, and uh, if yes, why? If no, why? Um, so brands that would have benefited had they not gone outside of their lineage. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, so like, you know, uh, if, 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 yeah, okay, I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, brand or brands today, whether you name them or not, you feel would have benefited because of their lineage had they decided not to go outside. Like, in other words, there was a next generation or maybe even not the next generation, but the generation after that. Do you feel that there were any brands that maybe you know, could have kept it in the family and they still would have been successful as opposed to either selling the company off or bringing Mm. in someone from the outside? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that comes down to intention. Like, what's your intention? Um, And there's, there's people who will start a watch brand or resuscitate a a watch brand that did exist, that did exist once and no longer exist. Um, and you really have to, I think the, the intention behind those decisions basically guides everything. It guides all of the choices that are made. And if your intention behind doing that is a commercial first intention, I think you sort of feel that. Whereas if it's something that's either to do with a family heritage or you have this sort of feeling of building something that exists beyond yourself, that you're building something with the intention of handing it down or, um, you know, sort of passing the baton kind of a thing. Um, That's a very different intention. Um, I tend to think that they end up being more successful because I think people can relate to that. I think it feels much more authentic. I think um, people tend to buy into that because, as Tim was saying, there's an inherent value there. So um, I can't actually think of any examples off the top of my head. Um, Maybe when Tim's talking, if they pop in, um, I'm happy to do that. But I can't think of any off the top of my head where if they'd decided to sort of keep things in the family, it would have gone better. I'm trying to think of like a really pragmatic, good example to sort of illustrate the point, but um, it's not coming to me at the moment, I'm afraid. Yeah. Guys, can we bring the clock back up, please? It's... All right. Um, Tim, you can speak as long as you want. I have no idea. Yeah. Okay, how how ironic is that? The clock fails at a watch fair. That's why we need watches. I think there are certainly times, you know, to, to Fiona's point, where you have to consider that there might be a reason that you wouldn't want the family to be the immediate heir. There are some times when the family has no inclination. Uh, just recently, Sela Nitro sold a share in his diamond-setting company out of Geneva to the Stern family of Patek Philippe. There was no natural heir. None of them wanted to inherit the company. So, you know, we're sort of arguing against our own position here in this round of the debate. I could see that sort of scenario where you pick the best investor and the best bid and the person you think would be the best custodian because the kids just aren't into it. So I can definitely see a situation where Fiona has a strong point there. When the best option is a kid who doesn't want the company, what do you do? You have to look outside. Mm. Okay, Fiona. Yeah, I mean, I think especially when it comes to to some of the things that um, add value specifically in Swiss watchmaking, you know, we always talk about, I mean, the the industry sells itself on creativity and craftsmanship. 
And those are very human things. They're very human qualities. So the creativity side, um, I will say that sometimes I find that quite frustrating because I think it's something that's used as a marketing tool. And if you look at the approach and uh, the business practices and the behavior, it's actually not you, you aligned. You think that staying in the family is often used as a marketing tool? So, um, I'm sorry. No, no, the, the, the sort of creativity side, which is used um, a lot in, in the marketing of, of watches in general, and the, and the craftsmanship side of things is also a, a, a sort of characteristic that's very specific to watches, I think, and is used as part of the value um, of watches in general. And so I think um, from a family point of view, if we're talking about making and we're talking about those two things, there's lots and lots of businesses where it's handed down from generation to generation um, when you're talking about the making of something in a specific craft. And that, I think, there, there, it is undisputed that unless you have an outsider who's basically an apprentice, who in a sense becomes a kind of pseudo part of the family because you work so closely, there's things that are handed down that you can't write out on paper. You can't teach and give a manual. You have to spend time with the person and be imbued um, with that. And I, so the family side of things from making, I think, is really important. Um, but yeah, from a business side, I mean, I'm kind of going against what I said earlier. Um, no, I think it would probably also apply there. Yeah. That's a kind of non-point, but there we okay. go. <laughs> but you look cute doing it, so. Thanks. Tim, you got a minute if you, wanna, if you have anything to say to that. I think it's also worth mentioning that sometimes going outside does involve bringing in another family. Take the example of Chopard. Sometimes the best candidate to receive a family firm is another family firm. So the Schäufles were jewelers from Forsheim, and they focused mostly on jewelry, and New York's finest, keeping us safe. <laughs> Somebody got their watch stolen. And so eventually, when the last of the practicing members of the Chopard watchmaking family were done with the business, um, the company was put up for sale. Now, at that point, anyone could have stepped in, um, a foreign investor, some sort of American equity group. Uh, it could have gone many different ways. But the Schäufles bought the Chopard concern from the Chopard family. And although we don't have continuity of one family chain of custody, we do see that sometimes the best outsider to take over a family business is also a family business. And, you know, the rest at Chopard is history. They make wonderful watches, and they still make wonderful jewelry. Can't argue that at all. Okay, Tim, this question is going to go to you as well. Um, as you are a long time, which you mentioned earlier, part of a family-run business, would you feel it was your duty to step in or say something if you felt the next generation was acting in ways that could potentially hinder the success of the business? Oh, I speak my mind all the time. I, I get in so much trouble for running my mouth, so I'm sure I would. Uh, so the, the answer is yes. I think there's different ways to deliver a message respectfully to people you respect. And I owe an awful lot to the families who've contributed to the success of Watchbox, but they always know they can expect nothing but honesty from me. And I always expect that I will receive a fair judgment from them. Three more minutes. OK, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> in, in terms of how I would deliver that message, I think it would be important for everyone involved in the discussion to be physically in the room. So I think everyone deserves the respect of being able to face his own accuser. So that is how I would break the news, both to the person who needs to hear it and to the person to whom, of whom I'm speaking. OK, Fiona. Um, do, you find, do you think it's your place? Like, would it be, or, you know, obviously, Tim said he already does this. So if you work for a family-run business, do you feel it would be your responsibility, or do you feel like, look, well, they, they made their bed. They're going to sleep in it. No, I mean, I think in, in with what we do, normally if we're brought in to work with, um, well, well, with any business, but I would say it's more, there's a more human element when it's a family-run business. If they've come to you, you would assume or expect that what they're looking for is a fresh perspective. They're not looking for you to just say yes to everything that they're already doing, because if that was the case, they wouldn't be asking us to be involved in the first place. So um, I, I think it's 
Tim was saying, there's a way of, of delivering stuff. But my assumption is that if I'm being brought in, it's because they're looking for an outside point of view on what they're doing. And I think part of that responsibility is to be honest with what you see. And, but you approach the discussion as a collaborative, uh, as a, as a sort of collaborative way of solving a puzzle, basically. It's not a judgment or a, I think you should do this, you know, like you're some sort of expert. It's more that you approach it that you're a team and you're working together to come out with the best outcome. And so your driver and your vision is the project, whatever the project is, whether it's a product, whether it's uh, growing the business, whether it's entering a certain market, whether it's opening a boutique, whatever the project is, that's the focus and the driver and that you're working together as a team to, to do that. So, um, yeah, if, if I saw something that I didn't agree with, I would, I, I would definitely say so. Um, I'm also a terrible liar. So clearly you, can, you couldn't even see paint. But that, that's the thing. But, but the thing is, You're you can, nice. <laughs> but you can see it, you can see on my face. So I might say, I might say the right thing, but people can see in my eyes, you know, if they're doing something and I just think, oh my what on earth are you doing? They can see it. Um, so I think ra rather just say, and even though sometimes it can be a bit of a bitter pill to swallow, I mean, I know that, you know, when I'm designing something, it's very personal. And to have somebody from outside talk about what you're doing when it's your heart and soul, when you're making something, or if it's a family business, you know, it is personal. Um, but I think you need to be open enough to hearing an outside opinion um, but it's also your job to be the filter. I think especially if you're talking about a family business and heritage, because um, you can have a gazillion different opinions on the same thing. And if you don't have a real sense of who you are, you're basically like a ping pong ball and wh whatever the next person says, you'll follow that. So it is a kind of balancing act between filtering out what you think is relevant to you and your broader vision um, but equally being open to hear things that sometimes you don't like. Um, and I think you can deliver that in a way that the person that you're speaking with on that, I mean, I have a sensitivity towards that. Um, I think how you say things sometimes can make all the difference. And if the point is that you would like somebody to see things in your way, if you discuss with them uh, in a way where they feel included in the conversation, it tends to go really well because normally people are looking for I don't know, like a new take on, on what they've been doing. Um, I think if you sort of rock up, like you have all the answers that and people, nobody likes that. So I'm going to, and you can uh, either cross examine or offer rebuttal, but I kind of want to do a little bit of a, a twist here. Hypothetically, what if Danny and Brian, what, what if the Goldbergs weren't the Goldbergs that you know? What if it was a different family? Do, would you still feel like you'd step in in that family situation and say, or, or, or is it like read the room? Well, if, if there's business to be discussed, then I have no problem speaking openly with the people who employ me. If it's a family matter that has nothing to do with the business and it's between two Govbergs, that's their business. I'm not going to intrude into that. But when it affects the company, I'm there. I'm at the company. I, I am a stakeholder. I believe that I help to uphold the ethics and the ingenuity and the entrepreneurial spirit there. And if I saw any of that withering because of a decision anyone made, I'd be very vocal about that. Again, tactful. There's a right way and a wrong way to speak to anyone, whether family ownership or not. But I always think it's important if you see something, say something. OK. Anything to add to that? No, no. Still no. Yeah, no. <laughs> Make fun of it. Make fun of his tie, just anything. OK, I'm actually going to ask a question. Uh, and I know that this is not necessarily a debate type question, but it is, again, a hypothetical question that's going to kind of go to you both. Uh, Tim, I, I will kick it to you first. If you, I don't, but are you, are you a parent? No. Uh, Fiona, I know you are not a parent. Mm -hmm. Okay, if hypothetically you had children, Fiona, you have your own business. Tim, you are part of a business, you're a stakeholder. Do you feel you would want your child to go into the business that you, you do, you are currently a part of right now? I would support any decision they make because I can tell you that my parents didn't uh, intend for me to become a watch spokesman. So, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so no, there would be no pressure, no expectations. Tell us what they did expect you to become, Tim. A doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> and I failed them. <laughs> 
hearts. I, I would be honored if my children wanted to follow in my footsteps. And there are many cases in the watch industry where initially the kids just had no interest. I know that uh, Pierre Biver, Jean-Claude Biver's son, said he wanted nothing to do with watches for his first 15 years on the earth. And then at age 18, his view started to turn. He got into it, all of a sudden it became cool, and he wanted to know more about what his dad did. And lo and behold, he's now 22, and he is probably going to be the last joint venture business partner uh, J.C. Biver calls in to start a new watch brand. Hopefully not, but this one looks like it's for keeps. And again, the kid wasn't into it for most of his life. So I would support my kids no matter what they want. I'd be honored if they chose to take after me. Fiona, thinking about the, what you went through and, and struggles, and, and, but also the high the high times, mm. not, you know, I mean, I know, we're, I know we're in New York, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, do you think that, again, hypothetically, you had a little Kruger running around, would you, a little, like, red, like, brightly colored hair, like, would you, would that be something that you would think, like, wow, that would be really cool to have them take over this, this company? Um, uh, I think it would really depend on their on their character. I think I would find it more painful to hand down something that I'd created to your child if you felt deep down actually they're not the right fit for it. You know, it, it might be that that's what you would like. I think there's an inherent thing with all people that we try and, you know, uh, avoid or we don't think about our own mortality. You know, we're not gonna be here forever. And this thing of having children and handing something down to your children, it's almost like a way of you sort of living on beyond your own life. There's a kind of comfort in that. And I think people tend to romanticize that and they're naturally drawn to that. And I totally get it. I mean, we live in a winemaking region. Um, and honestly, there's nothing more heartbreaking than a winemaker who's been, you know, making wine for generations and the kids are not interested and they literally have to sell everything, the vineyards, the house, the whole lot. And it actually does break your heart. There's a bit of you that wants the fairy tale of like, oh, you know, uh, whoever it was, they were inspired and they wanted to follow in their parents' footsteps. But I would find it so much more difficult if I had children and, uh, well, one... Um, if they just sort of did it without considering it, I think it should be a real choice. I can imagine for Jean-Claude Biver, maybe there's a bit of him that actually thought uh, that he was quite happy with the fact that his son wasn't interested and then changed his mind rather than from the beginning was just like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. You know, there, it says something that it's a conscious choice rather than just kind of going with the flow. Um, and, and also, um, especially when it's a creative thing, if I, I mean, with my nieces, when they're coloring in, like, I can't help myself but want to, like, you know, get all involved. So I can imagine if I had a kid, I would be like the nightmare parent of, like, yeah, you take over the business and you're always sort of hovering in the background. <laughs> I would be that person. So um, I don't know. I think in a way, if they did want to take it over, I would actually force them to do something else first. And then if they really, really wanted it, then okay. But I would also have to be ready to fully, fully step away from that. Um, I remember with uh, Agenor, um, which was founded by Jean-Marc Wiederhecht, um, and now his sons run the business. I mean, talk about big shoes to fill, you know, uh, incredible. Um, and I think the fact that they went off and they did their own things and then came into the business afterwards. But I mean, you know, if you meet the two brothers, it's almost like they were never really going to do anything else, N not because there's this kind of weight of a legacy, but they're just inherently like it's, it's in their soul, you know, to sort of do that. So that's a kind of nice um, sort of nice version of, of how that can pan out. Um, I mean, on your point, I was going to say as well, uh, when I went to art school, honestly, my parents could not have been more terrified, disappointed, <laughs> thinking... <laughs> I was, and I know because they were thinking, oh my goodness, she is never going to get a job ever in her life, you know. Um, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and, I th and so I think for them it would have been, I think there is a kind of safety thing. It would have been really nice if I'd taken a sort of cushy road and if there had been a family business, I know for a fact my dad probably would have wanted me to like go down that road. Um, 
I'm but just I, letting her riff. You're okay with that, right? Yeah. At um, this point, we've got time. So. But but I think but I think it is a really valu valuable experience, even if you are going to do that, that you go off and like figure out your own stuff, and then you come back and you bring something of value to the table rather than just kind of fall into it. And yeah. Any addition? Do you want to make fun of her for anything? I want my child <laughs> to be a supervillain. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so good. That is so good. Uh, okay, well, we're relatively uh, at the end of this, and what I wanted to ask the group that's here, which is a really nice group that's here, I see a lot of familiar faces, is if we were going to pick a side, now I get it, we get it, it there is a gray area, but this is the first debate, and this is the first time we're sort of trying this out, but if you were going to pick a side between these two sides of like, keeping it in the family, go to the outsider, can I see a show of hands which way you would go for keeping it in the family? I know, I better see Mr. Siddiqui like putting his hand up there. <laughs> hey, come on. Okay. Okay. So, we're, I mean, higher, higher, higher. I want to see what you want to. Oh, actually, that's a decent shot. Yeah, well done. Okay. Anybody else who wants to go the other route? Bring in, bring in the, the new blood. Let's see somebody who's yeah, yeah, yeah. not got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Good job. Come on. I also want my kid to be a super villain. Come on. Yes, come yeah, on. come on, come on. <laughs> Well done. All right, we are going to maybe open up the floor. If we could keep it, to, of course, James, of course. If we could keep it to the topic at hand, that would be awesome. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Jamesy here did have his hand up front. We probably have an, enough time for maybe three or four <laughs> questions. But do try to keep it at the, you know, about what we were talking about, dear. I think it's important that I'd like to hear the, the views of our two panelists on the difference between family-owned and family-run businesses and family-owned and independently managed businesses. My humble opinion is that family-owned but independently managed businesses are inherently much more successful. I, I, I look at Audemars, Rolex, Chanel, Hermes, and compare it to the Swatch. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said it. He said it. Well, I'll, I'll remind the field that the Swatch Group is largely publicly held and publicly traded, so the vast majority of the stakeholders are people who own the stock, not the family. I, I do. Th Let him finish. They, they do. Oh, it's okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it, there's definitely something to be said for the family being in an oversight role. Now, the family needs to be there to step in and turn the ship around before you know the boat goes over the waterfall. So I think there's a fine line between a family that oversees and a family that manages. I think a family that oversees needs to put in place a talented team of people who are carefully vetted and selected. I don't think at this point, with its sprawling structure and many independent business entities and institutional shareholders, uh, the Swatch Group's controlling family is really in a position to control all those factors, whereas a more intimately family-held company like Patek or an Audemars you would absolutely see the founding, or not the founding, but the controlling families uh, take care to hire the best people and then keep them on a short leash. Mm. Fiona, do you have any? Uh... Yeah, um, although I don't like your short leash, but. Um... <laughs> yes, we got it! <laughs> My American business analogy, sorry. Yeah, not keen on that. Um, I would have to agree with you, James, on that point, because I'd, I'd, what's interesting is if you, if, if you have a family. Um, not necessarily run, but a family business, and there's family members that are still very active in it, they don't necessarily run it day to day, and you are brought in as an outsider. Well, one, there tends to be a much more sort of personal um, element to that business. And there's a very human side of it when where it's like purely sort of shareholders and there's no family element, it can be a little bit impersonal. So from an outside point of view, I think that does actually have a very positive impact. You feel as somebody, you feel like you've been invited into something that's very precious. There's a kind of inherent um, desire to show that you respect the family, that you respect what's been built, and the kind of feeling of, okay, I need to prove that I'm actually worthy. You know, they've taken a bet on me as an outsider. They've taken a risk here, and I want to show them that that was a good thing to do. So, um, but I do think that bringing in outside 
blood um, does help things. I, I genuinely do. I think it's it's why, like I was saying at the beginning, it's why businesses look outside to avoid things like groupthink. I think particularly as well with the Swiss watch industry, okay, it's based in Switzerland, but it's not a Swiss watch industry making Swiss watches for Swiss people who are all into a Swiss culture. You know, it's a global industry selling to lots of different cultures. And I think that's really important to speak to people that are not from Switzerland, from the Jura region. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I think um, it, it just, it, if you're selling things on a global stage, I think bringing in outside people, whether it's a design consultant, whether it's to do with, you know, how, how you show your pieces in a certain market, um, I think that's really sort of helpful. So I think you do need the two. Okay. Uh, show of hands. Gary, can we get Gary? <laughs> <laughs> so once I got over my uh, disappointment of not being the heir to a large business, I started thinking about the topic. Uh, and in my career, I've advised actually a lot of family businesses, including some really big ones. And I think uh, the thing that people don't realize is it can be really miserable, miserable being an heir. Uh, and uh, particularly when dad, or in your case, uh, mom of your non-existent daughter, uh, <laughs> is hovering all the time, oh, or doesn't worse. step back, or wants to make every decision, it could be an awful, awful existence. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll start with you, Tim. Uh, uh, you know, how can you help uh, the next generation uh, when things uh, can get a little sticky with uh, intergenerational issues? You mean my children or the children of the people? Uh, I, I, well, let's. Yeah, we won't call them the Govbergs, but let's call them the Bovbergs uh, or, or, or the Bivares. <laughs> so I would always say to people, look, everyone builds on what came before, whether it's your parents, a mentor, a benefactor. No one raises themselves from an infant. So you've already benefited from some sort of assistance in life. That doesn't determine who you're going to be, whether you're an heir or you're building yourself up from poverty or you're building yourself up from a middle class existence. Uh, you get to choose who you're going to be. You don't get to choose your past because up to a certain point through childhood, it's kind of determined for us. But I think the goal should always be to put your stamp on your own life. If that means putting a stamp on the business, that's your own style, your own sensibility, your own values, great. If it's your career, great. I would tell people to be themselves, but also realize that an inheritance is a great opportunity to make something of themselves. Yeah, be yourself, your own values, your own vision of who you dreamed of being, live that out, but also preserve that of value that came before. Ideally, the combination of your own identity and hopes and the inheritance should be greater than either one individually. But what if mom or dad are driving you nuts and aren't getting out of the way? Well, honestly, I would just say, look, your identity, your destiny is not set in stone. If you really don't want to do something, don't get muscled into it. I'm neither a doctor nor a lawyer, which is why I'm here. <laughs> So that's kind of how it is. Any other questions? Okay, Ricardo. <clears throat> Do you think family-owned can be a natural hindrance to a global market? Because if something is family-owned, you bring in some of those family values that aren't always necessarily positive. So do you think, especially if you're trying to go to a global scale, do you think that's a hindrance to really approaching a global market? Yeah. Um, do I think it's a hindrance? Um, I mean, I think it really, it, it depends. It really depends on the family and the business and the, and the values that it is. I mean, that's a kind of wishy-washy answer, but it, it really does, I think, depend on that. I don't, I can't actually see why it would be a hindrance unless there's something that say you're, you're a family from a specific, uh, part of the world um and your values are very much tied to the culture of that place it might be that in other countries those things don't sort of translate as much so in that instance it's not so much a hindrance i think if you're open to like learning from somebody who's a specialist or from that market that you want to enter and they can help you to see how do you translate your sort of family way in a language that our market can understand you know i think if i think if 
you're open-minded enough to that. And sometimes it means modifying what you're doing or changing the way that you would explain something. You might not be very comfortable with it, but that's when I think you have to rely on partners that you trust implicitly because they'll know better than you. You know, there's certain, for example, some of the watches that we've designed, um, mm. Uh, I, I just assumed for some of them that they were potentially more for women or more for men. We make everything unisex. I never even considered whether it was male, female or unisex. I just wanted to make an amazing object and whoever liked it, liked it. But I would look at it and with my bias, just assume, oh, this is probably more for women or more for men. And then when you travel and you go to different parts of the world, actually, it's the opposite. And a piece that I thought was going to be for women, it was all men who wanted it. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because if I just gone in guns blazing with what I assume is the way to present something with all my bias, I might have actually put off a potential customer because I'm kind of telling them, you know, just my way of seeing things. Um, so that's not necessarily to do with family values specifically, but it's an example that you could apply also to the to the family values and the family heritage side of things. I think you need to rely on people that are experts in things that you're not an expert in and be humble enough to know that and um, and ask them the right questions, find the right people, and then kind of work with them. Yeah. The only time I really discovered that there was like a firewall between family and non-family in the luxury industry was in my very early days in the watch business when I first got out of the Navy. And a lot of times I would walk up and down 47th Street and, you know, that's the Diamond District in New York, uh, it's also the pre-owned watch district. So I would often you know, offer idiomatic English copywriting for websites for folks who mostly just outsourced stuff to family overseas. And a lot of times they found that that idiomatic English ad copy was the one thing they couldn't outsource. A lot of those businesses are dealing with incredible amounts of value. They are dealing with a business that hasn't fundamentally changed in its economics or its craft aspects in a few hundred years. And they do tend to be very inwardly focused on in-groups and family and small circles of people they can trust with a lot of money, which is why I think that's one example and probably the only example where I found a large luxury sector is almost completely dependent to the point where it might be hamstrung by family tradition uh, and it can't really expand beyond it. Hmm. Okay, we have probably time for one more. Uh, this gentleman here in the middle, sorry. <clears throat> Um, could you each name a watch that you think would have been better had it been made by a group if it was made by an independent? And it would have been better made by an independent if it was actually made by a group. Or I'm using group, but it's, it's basically a stand-in for, for a family-run business. So the question is, uh, can you think of a watch made by a major family-run brand that you think would have been a better product had it been produced by a company that was independent? Or I guess the, the, the fundamental question is like, how much does product development get impacted by family ownership? But I'm, I'm wondering if you can illustrate that perhaps through examples of actual watches from, from both sides of, of that world. Okay. Well, I think if we take the example of an independent watch that would have been better made by a group, in general, we're talking about products that are underdeveloped. I've seen a lot of watches from companies that maybe didn't have the development resources to make something work right the first time along. Uh, a good example of that would be, uh, again, this is a very small company and not exactly a family tradition because it's all first generation, but Maitre du Temple and some of their calendar watches had a little bit of trouble, uh, particularly with the chapter three. There were some issues with the shutter mechanism that displayed the second time zone. And I felt like no two of them worked exactly the same way. Uh, the setting system for the moon phase, which was an intermediate position on the crown, had a very indistinct clutch position to the point where I would have to hunt around for a few minutes to change the moon phase and cycle the date. Uh, and then another example I'd say is uh, David Kendo, multi-generational watchmaker, family tradition. I feel like some of the watches he's launched with his spring-loaded retractable crown are not quite ready for prime time. Like, I really like the guy, I really like the watch, but if, say, the Swatch Group had developed this, there would have been money to make sure that that retractable telescoping crown worked perfectly every time. And so, in general, I find that small, family-run, or first-generation watch brands do a great job with concept, design, and 
coherence of design because everything's designed by either an individual or a small team, uh, whereas big groups do things well that include massive mass production, quality control, you know, interchangeable spare parts, things like that. So in general, I would say that any underdeveloped independent brand watch that breaks when you get it would have benefited from the attention of a group. And I think if you want to look at the product of a group that probably would have been better handled by an independent, take something like the... Okay, I'm sorry, did I say that? Oh, no, you're good. I meant to, I meant to think it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I would say something like one of the 45.5 millimeter Omega Seamaster Planet Oceans. It seems like one person showed up and said, it needs to be big. And the other person said, dive watches sell best. And the other person's like, and chronographs are really popular. So you wind up with this watch the size and shape of a fist that no normal human wrist can wear. So yeah, an independent would have done a better job. <laughs> Fiona, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I don't. I don't actually. Although what I would say is, um, I mean, I think uh, an, an example of something that's worked really well or is really interesting um, was the latest collaboration that um, with Carrie Vutilainen and Zenith, and I thought that was a really good example of that done really, really well because it's not like they went to Carrie and said, uh, okay, make us like a whole new thing. They basically looked at what they had. They looked at what his skill set is, what he's really, really good at doing and where he brings the magic. And they were like, okay, we can bring this to the table. You can bring this to the table if you're interested. I think it would be amazing, which it is. So it doesn't even look like a sort of hybrid like Vuti Line and Zenith. It, it doesn't look like that, but it was the right person for the right job, the specific part of that product. And I think that's an example of where that's done really well. Um, and I think that collaborative approach is, um, yeah, when it's done well, it's amazing, actually. And it's really nice to see people that are open to doing that and not about them building themselves. I don't want to show you what I'm doing. You know, that kind of that's a real sort of, it's like a handbrake on anything moving forward. I thought that was a really lovely, positive example within the industry of like, you know, big names that have done some amazing things. Um, so that was more of a positive one. Apologies for not, again, Care Bear, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, tomorrow we will have another Click Clock debate with Jonathan Ferrer of Brew Watches and with Bertrand Melon uh, of H. Moser. Uh, join us here in this room at 2 o'clock p.m. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to my speakers. Please give a handshake to one another. Thank you. Moderator handshake. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs>